Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending today's talk and giving me the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. Uh, the topic of my talk is interworking 1M to M with 3GP networks. And I think over the past uh, few weeks, many of you have heard some talks and discussion about how 1M to M can interwork with other technologies such as proximal networks like uh, OCF and lightweight M to M and, and Zigbee. The, uh, the inner working I'm going to talk about today is it's just a little bit different. Um, and this is inner working of 1M2M to underlying 3GP networks, which 1M2M uses as a connectivity plane in many cases to, uh, to communicate with cellular IoT devices. So uh, that'll be the topic of my talk today. So first, a little bit of background. Um, 3GPP has been adding and defining IoT features dating all the way back uh, release 10 back in 2011 is when they got started um, looking at IoT and what they needed to do within the 3GPP standard to uh, add some functionality and services to support IoT. Um, they have continued evolving that um, all the way through uh, release 15 was their, is their latest release, which was released uh, late 2018. Uh, but they're not stopping there. Uh, release 16 and release 17, uh, which they're actively working on right now, they continue to uh, to add and build out functionality and features. So um, the types of things that they're looking at is you know features to help um, avoid network congestion from the massive numbers of IoT devices um, that are anticipated to be connecting to uh, cellular networks. Uh, features to help maximize the uh, the network resource utilization and efficiency to help minimize the the, uh, the amount of equipment and the deployment costs uh, for, for network operators. Uh, features to help keep the network more secure, given that cellular IoT devices um, have increased types of threats that um, are kind of specific to, to IoT use cases, as well as uh, perhaps even one of the most, most important things is, you know, how do we maximize the, uh, the battery life for, for IoT type of devices? Um, we've heard probably projections that, um, you know, uh, devices, uh, narrowband IoT devices can uh, hopefully achieve battery lives of uh, 10 years or more. So, you know, creating functionality to, to help enable that. So uh, what's also exciting is uh, even though the standard has been working on this for quite some time and developing these features, um, the network operators are now actually starting to bring this to, to, uh, to market. And uh, we're starting to see that the rollout of these features in the actual uh, networks uh, around the world which is a key piece to, to help enable cellular IoT to, uh, to start taking off. Likewise, we're starting now to see increasing numbers of cellular IoT devices that are also starting to hit the market, which is exciting. Um, the uh, the narrowband IoT devices, um, and the LTE CADM1 devices, even the higher category devices used in IoT device use cases such as video surveillance. So it's exciting to see the, uh, the chipset vendors and the, uh, the device manufacturers now uh, you know, bringing those to market and uh, which is creating uh, an exciting time for IoT uh, and, and, and cellular IoT in particular. So let, let's take a look at a, a typical cellular IoT deployment. Yeah, in this slide here, uh, you know, on the left side, we have our, our cellular IoT devices. Um, those devices are connecting into a, uh, a 3GP network. Inside of that network, uh, we have those IoT features that I was talking about, uh, you know, being defined by 3GP and being deployed by the operators. And then what you typically see is you see an IoT server um, uh, sitting uh, either within the operator's network or outside the network, uh, uh, operator's network and being deployed by uh, IoT service providers. And then we have applications uh, that are looking to communicate uh, down to these devices and either uh, send commands down to the devices to do things like uh, lock or unlock doors, um, as an example, or receive sensor readings from these devices that, that travel up through the, uh, the 3GP network, through the IoT server, and into the applications. So what are some of the, uh, the observations that we're seeing you know, as, as part of these cellular IoT deployments? One of them is the, uh, the types of features that 3GP has defined. Uh, they tend to be a little bit lower level, very technical in nature. So um, you know, if, for the folks that are looking to use these, these features, whether they be the device manufacturers or the application developers, they, they tend to have to be a little bit more savvy and uh, have a low level technical grasp of 3GPP and the features and functionality in order for these features to be used correctly. In addition to that, um, it typically requires some sort of business relationship to be had with the network operator, which sometimes can be very challenging for um, you know, certain device manufacturers or application developers who um, you know, don't necessarily have the means to have that relationship. So this can present a higher barrier of use and adoption of these IoT 
um, features um, being developed by 3GPP and being deployed by operators. Um, and this can present uh, some, some challenges for the ecosystem, right? For example, if, if these features aren't used correctly or they're not used um, uh, in, a, in a widely deployed manner, then that, that can result in inefficient use of the network resources, which can translate into higher costs, less scalability for the operators, or shorten battery life of the devices. Um, you know, that's, and that can result in the inability to deploy cellular IoT devices in certain use cases, you know, um, that requires uh, long battery life for devices. It could also result in security threats to the network, to the devices, and also to the, uh, the applications and users that, that are looking to interact with these devices. So based off of that, 1M2M saw a good opportunity to, um, to jump in and, and offer some additional value add to, to uh, cellular IoT deployments. So if you, you take a look at this fit, figure here, what I'm showing here is 3GPP has worked on exposing the IoT features through an external API through this, uh, at least in the um, in the 4G architecture, it's called a, a SCEF, a service capability exposure function. In 5G, it's called the network exposure function. But they expose these services through an API called the, uh, the T8 reference point. And what 1M2M has done is 1M2M has used this exposure to allow 1M2M to overlay on top of the services defined by 3GP some additional value add services. So if we take a look at the 1M2M architecture, which is a very distributed end-to-end -end architecture where we can deploy the 1M2M service layer on the IoT server. We can deploy 1M2M down on the IoT devices. We can also deploy 1M2M on the user applications that want to communicate with those devices. And this end-to-end -end system using 1M2M and having it overlay and communicate with the 3 p network, we can then uh, start to provide some additional services. So 1M2M in its third release, which was released at the end of 2018, and uh, is the first IoT service layer standard to interwork with 3 p and 3 pps IoT features through this external T8 reference point. So it's helping build out the standardization ecosystem um, uh, you know, and, and layering on top of what 3 p has defined. So uh, again, these, we're not looking to undo or replace anything that 3 p has done. We're looking to, uh, to complement it and, and uh, add additional value, as well as help with the adoption of the 3 p IoT features, making them easier to use and more available to more stakeholders in the ecosystem. And as well as you know, giving the, the network operator even more means to uh, move up the, uh, the value chain. So in addition to an operator leveraging the IoT features um, defined by 3GPP, they can leverage the very complementary features defined by 1M2M and continue to move up the value chain and, and not just offer connectivity-based services, but also offer um, IoT-based services that can be um, a little bit less connectivity-centric even, and even more data-centric. Okay, so at this point, you're probably asking yourself, well, wh wh what are some examples of what we mean by 1M2M value-add services that we can deploy alongside or over top of the 3 p IoT services? So for the remainder of the presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through some examples of what 1M2M has defined and how that interworks and interacts with what 3 p has defined. And in, in doing that, hopefully you can get a little bit better appreciation of um, of, of what 1M2M is doing and, uh, and, and how the two are, are, are uh, very complementary and, and can interplay with each other. Now, I can't go over all, everything that 1M2M is defined. There just isn't enough time you know, on the call. So I'm, I'm hoping to give you a little bit of a taste and uh, hopefully pique your interest, and then you can go off and, and perhaps learn some more. So if we take a look at uh, this first example, I'm gonna focus in on a, uh, a service enrollment example. And here, in this example, we've got some IoT devices deployed in the field. And we've got a, an application over on the right-hand side here. And this application, for example, could be deployed, let's say, in a smart city command and control center. And uh, you know, we may have a, uh, a user in this that wants to get a device enrolled and uh, registered onto the network such that it can start interacting and using the device. So what 1M10 has defined is the capability for that application to send a request to the service layer, and that request can be a, a request to, to get this device enrolled and, and registered in. The service, the 1M2M service layer, through the APIs with the 3GP network, can send what's known as a trigger request, 
and that 3GPP trigger request is sent over the control plane of the network with the intent of having that device establish a network connection. And then what 1M2M has done is we have piggybacked and encapsulated additional 1M2M information inside of that trigger message. And that, that, that 1M2M information allows the device to be able to uh, receive information about a 1M2M enrollment function. When it receives that information, the device can reach out and contact the 1M2M enrollment function and be authenticated as well as be uh, provisioned and bootstrapped with information such as identifiers and credentials and contact information for the IoT server and the service layer that's hosted on that IoT server. Using that information, the device can now register in to the service layer and be authenticated by the service layer and the service layer can let the device know that it's been registered successfully as well as the service layer can notify the, uh, the application that now your, your, the, uh, the device has been enrolled, it's been registered, and it's ready to be used. So now the application can start uh, interacting and using that device. Okay, moving on. Uh, another example I'd like to show you is uh, the capability in 1M2M to help manage in, uh, the sleep schedule uh, of, of, of IoT devices. As we talked about, the, the battery life time of, of cellular IoT devices is very important. Um, and in order to achieve those those 10-year battery lives that have been promised for, for cellular IoT devices, um, at the same time, allowing applications to interact with these devices, it requires a bit of coordination. And what I'd like to describe to you here on this slide is, is how 1M2M can help out with that. So what 1M2M has defined is the capability for both IoT devices and the applications hosted on the IoT devices to provide 1M2M with schedule information about um, what sleep pattern this device would like to have. Uh, for example, a, a device may um, uh, uh, provide information to the 1M2M service layer stating that the, its preference would be that it would like to wake up you know, at, at a period of uh, once a week or once a month. Likewise, the applications on the right-hand side that want to communicate with this device, um, let's say we've got an application that's sitting back in a utility company, and this application wants to uh, query a smart meter once a month to detect the usage uh, on the smart meter, and it may want to do that at a certain date and time. So we can provide that information to the 1MTEM service layer. Using requirements from both the, the, the device side and the user application side, the 1MTEM service layer can coordinate uh, in a line what is the best time for this device to, to be connected to the network and to be available such that uh, the user application can communicate with the device and, and it, it, it will be available. And at the same time, maximize it can conserve the battery life as much as possible. So what one intent can do is find that, that, that optimal schedule and then it can translate that schedule down into the low level uh, scheduling parameters required by 3GPP, which are very technical low level parameters. For those of you who are familiar with 3GPP, it's their, uh, the PSM timers and the extended DRX cycle timers. These are very low-level types of parameters and, and not exactly easy to, to program and use and keep consistent, but 1M2M can compute those, pass them down to the network, and then the network can use that information to, to then configure the device. And what ends up happening is now the device ends up sleeping and waking up you know, at a schedule that's convenient and uh, meets the requirements of the user applications that want to talk to that device. So there we have end-to-end -end schedule management uh, happening through 1M2M. The next example is I'll show you how 1M2M can help out with uh, message delivery handling. So 3GPP has defined the capability for uh, uh, services to subscribe to the 3GPP network and receive information about what is the availability of the device. So um, if a device does enter into a power saving mode and, and goes to sleep, then the core network can send the notification to 1M2M and 1M2M can now know that the device is sleeping. Now, if and when a, an application comes along and would like to send a request and interact with that device, the service layer can check whether the device is indeed available or not. And based off of that, it can, it can buffer the request until that device becomes available. So if the device at a later time does wake up, the network can send a notification to 1M2M to say that they, uh, the device is now available. 1M2M can check to see whether or not the, it has any messages that, that are targeted towards that device and have been buffered in the service layer. And it can send those messages now to the device since it's now awake. 
And after it does that, it can now notify the application that it is, is, is uh, forwarded its request. And all of this can be done in a very um, abstracted manner. You know, the application may not even know that the device was sleeping and that the 1M2M service layer was buffering the request uh, until the device woke up. And uh, it, so it can, it can be done in a very abstract manner and it can simplify life for the application developer who doesn't need to even worry about any of that. Moving on to another uh, example is in 1MJM, we, we, we've added some additional value add around location tracking. Um, so if we have an application that wants to specify uh, that it would like to know uh, if a device leaves a certain specified geographical area or what we call a geofenced area, 1MTM offers a nice service to allow applications to actually request that, that type of notification. So here we have the application sending that type of request to the service layer. 1MTM supports the capability to subscribe to a 3GPP network and receive a notification about what is the current location of the device, which that's a functionality that 3GPP supports, uh, is monitoring the current location of the device. So when receiving that type of request from, from 1M2M, the network can actually start tracking the current location of the device for it. Now, if that device ends up moving to a new location, the 3GP network can send a notification up to the service layer, and the service layer can process that notification, take a look at where the device is currently at, and based off of the, the current location of the device, it can compare it to the geofenced uh, area specified by the application. and if it, if it hasn't moved outside of that area, then the service layer doesn't need to notify the application. But if it has moved outside of that specified area or region, the service layer can now notify the application and let them know that uh, the, uh, the device has left the area specified. So that's an example of a, a very complementary feature on top of the uh, 3GP uh, functionality to monitor the current location. The next example is is uh, a nice feature that is helping uh, network operators, and uh, this one's involving you know cases where congestion can happen in certain areas of an operator's network. So if we have the scenario where where that congestion does uh, happen, one M to M supports the capability to subscribe to an underlying three P network and receive notifications if and when certain parts of an operator's network become congested. So if that happens, then the, the network operator can send the notification to the 1M2M service layer. And using that information, 1M2M can use it to uh, intelligently process requests that come in from applications. And if those, applic if those requests target a device that happens to be residing in, in a congested area of the network, then the 1M2M service layer can buffer that request contingent on you know, the fact that the network is, is uh, is congested in that area and then later if once the congestion is, is uh, subsides a notification can be sent to the service layer that it is now okay to send requests to devices in that location and um, the one time service layer can can uh, take those requests that it, that it has buffered and forward them along so in doing this one time is helping uh, fix or uh, reduce the amount of congestion and not make the congestion worse by uh, making sure it selectively uh, buffers uh, certain requests targeting devices in, in congested areas of the network, which is a nice feature for um, network operators. Okay, the, uh, the last example, since we're running a bit short on time, is um, more of a security-centric example. And this one's involving um, how 1M2M can assist and help for cases where uh, IoT devices are tampered with. And what we mean by tampering is, um, in, in many use cases, as we know, IoT devices can be deployed, you know, in a very uh, unmanned centric manner where they're, 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 they're deployed and they're, and they're left alone for long periods of time. In addition to that, they can also be deployed in very public accessible areas, you know, uh, let's say within a city. So the problem with that is they're much more susceptible to, uh, to tampering. Somebody can come along and, and, uh, and do some bad things to the device. So one of those types of things um, is the, uh, the, the, the SIM card information um, can, can be tampered with. It, for example, maybe a SIM card can be removed from a device or replaced with an, another SIM card or moved to uh, take it out of one device and put it into another device. So 3GBP has added the capability within um, its, its, its standard 
to allow a network to detect if and when the SIM card of a device has been tampered with. What 1MTM has done is 1MTM has is added the capability to subscribe down to a network to receive notifications if and when the network detects a device that's been tampered with. So after subscribing to uh, the, 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 the network, if, if a device happens to be tampered with, uh, and if that tampered device is detected by the network, for example, uh, a device's NZ has changed value, which is its identifier, which is uh, the, the, the network can send a notification up to the 1MTM service center to let it know that this device uh, has been tampered with. And what 1MTM can now do is take action. And for example, if a request is either received from the device or a request is received from an application that wants to talk to that device, 1M2M can stop processing those requests and blacklist the device and uh, discontinue the flow of information to or from that device, which can uh, help you know, the, the, uh, the network operator. It can also help protect the, uh, the, uh, the user applications that are, that are uh, interacting with that device. So it's an additional layered on functionality above and beyond what 3 p is, 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 is defining to, uh, to help assist out uh, there. So that was the set of examples I wanted to walk through today. Um, just some points that I'd like you to kind of take away from the talk. Um, you know, the first one being, of course, that, you know, 1MTM in its third release, it supports the capability to interwork with 3 uh networks and the features, the IoT features that have been defined by 3 p and that are now um, starting to hit the market. And uh, 1MTM is, is defining uh, some additional uh, value add and complementary services that uh, can be coupled with the IoT services that 3 p has defined and together offer uh, an even better end-to-end -end, uh, service for, for IoT devices as well as the network operators and the, uh, the user applications uh, that want to interact with them. Um, 1MTM in doing that is, is helping ease the use as well as the adoption of the 3 p IoT features by, by raising the abstraction level for some of these features, making them easier to use maybe reducing the uh, requirement that you have to have a relationship and, uh, with, with the network operator. And it's also uh, providing uh, the capability for, for operators to continue to move up the value chain. And in addition to just offering um, connectivity-centric services, giving them the capability to uh, you know, offer additional types of services to their customers um, and uh, maybe uh, uh, also have additional forms of revenue uh, as, as well. So with that, um, you know, if you're looking for more information and, and to learn more, um, you can refer to uh, the, uh, the TS-26 specification. That's uh, the, the specification that 1MTM uh, uses to define the, the 3 p and working um, aspects. And that's available at the 1MTM.org website. So again, uh, thank you for your time today. I appreciate the, uh, the, the time to uh, be able to help uh, you better understand some of the, the 3 p and working capabilities of 1MTM and, and, and how it fits into the ecosystem. and I, I personally think that cellular IoT is going to be a big uh, game changer for, for IoT deployments, uh, especially those that need to scale and um, deploy devices in a very wide area network-centric manner, like uh, deployments like smart cities, as well as uh, deployments in remote regions and, and uh, where we don't have local area connectivity. So with that, um, you know, hopefully you walk away with a, a better appreciation of uh, how, how 1M2M can, can help in this situation. So th th thank you very much.